All right, now this is kind of a longer chapter, Matthew chapter 13, but one of the things you want to call your attention to, what you should notice in Matthew chapter 13 is all the parables that Jesus has given here. He's given a lot of parables, right? And in um, verse number 34, the Bible reads, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. So when Jesus was preaching, when he was going about his ministry and all these great throngs and these multitudes came to Christ, he didn't teach them directly and straightly like he did with his disciples. His disciples says, unto you it's given to know the mysteries. And he would, he would expound and explain and go into detail with his disciples. But when it was just great masses and people were just following him, you know, he got a lot of attention, obviously, from doing, performing miracles and healing the sick and doing all these different things that gathered a big crowd. Now, my first point I just want to make is that when we come to church, church is a congregation of believers. That's what it's designed for. That's what God intended for it to be. We are to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. We are to compel and commend, but first, the, 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 the point of church is not to get people saved within the, the, the confines of this building, of this structure. This is where we meet together to, to congregate as saved believers in Christ, to learn, to, to fellowship, to, to be edified, to hear from God's word. We are to go out, get people saved, and then bring them in, get them baptized, you know, the Great Commission, disciple them, teach them. It was the same thing that Jesus was doing. He was expounding unto his disciples. They were saved. They were the people who were following him. And the great, the great mass, you know, most of them probably weren't saved. You know, the Bible says that, that there are few that are saved. When, when his disciples asked him, are there, you know, are there few that be saved, Lord? And he basically said yes. He says, great is the way which, lead, you know, which leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So when he's teaching unto the multitudes, he's just using these, these parables. And he's using these, these illustrations. But he's not really going into depth and going into detail. Now look at uh, verse number 9, here in Matthew 13. After he finishes just giving the parable of the sower, very famous parable. Verse 9 says, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? So they asked the question, Why? Why, Lord? Why are you giving them these, these parables? You know, it's not really, you know, it's just, you're just kind of telling a story. Why aren't you just coming straight out and, and saying things? He says, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. The Bible says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Lord. You know, an unregenerate person, someone who's not saved, someone who's not of the Holy Spirit residing inside of them, they cannot understand the, the mysteries of God. They can't understand. They need to get saved first in order to be able to comprehend, in order to be able to receive the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12 says, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Now keep a finger or bookmark here in Matthew 13. We're going to flip back to Isaiah chapter 6, where he's quoting, Jesus Christ is quoting from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. So we're going to go back and look at that quote of what he's saying is being fulfilled. The prophecy that's being fulfilled when he's preaching unto the multitudes and saying that hearing they're going to hear, but they're not going to understand, and seeing they're going to see, but not perceive. They're not going to get it. They're not going to understand. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse number 8. The Bible reads, Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, Lord, send me. And amen, that's a whole other sermon of itself. I'm here, God, I'm here. I, send me, I want to preach your word. And look at what he tells him. This is what God tells Isaiah. He's saying, look, send me, I'm ready to go. I want to go preach. 
Verse 9, and he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Look at verse 10. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. So we see here when Jesus is quoting, these are people that their heart has been made fat. They don't, they don't feel like they need anything, right? Their heart is full, it's fat. It says that they, um, they hear, but they don't understand. Their ears are heavy. Their ears have been made heavy. They, they, it's, it's a burden to even listen to anything anymore. And their eyes are shut. They don't even want to really know. Now, there's a great multitude following Jesus, but I think a lot of those people are just following to kind of see the show, to see what's going on. It's interesting. It's exciting, right? There's things going on. But what do they really want to know? Do they really want to hear the truth? Now, everything I've been, I've been saying, so go back to Matthew 13, is just kind of way of introduction to, to the main subject matter of the sermon this morning. And what I'm going to be preaching on is having ears that are dull of hearing. The people in, in Jesus' day here that were following him, the, one of their main problems is they had ears that were dull of hearing. They didn't want to hear anymore. They, they, start, they, they came to follow Jesus. They started to hear these. Jesus taught to them in parables because he already knew their heart was, was, was waxed fat. He's not even giving, you know, the Bible says to cast not your pearls before swine. He was giving them some teaching but it wasn't anything they were really able to grasp and get. Now, Jesus did come and he won souls one-on-one, -on -one, but when the unsaved masses just came to him, by and large, he just taught to them in parables because their ears are dull of hearing. It says in verse 15 of Matthew, back in Matthew 13 where we were, Matthew 13, 15 says, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible, you know, the Bible is clear. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants people to be saved. But there's nothing that he can do when people have closed their own eyes. He says, their eyes, they have closed. Their ears are dull of hearing. It's not that they haven't been hearing the word of God. It's not that it hasn't been being preached. It's not that they haven't had opportunity. But they've decided to close their eyes. They've decided to become dull of hearing. I don't want to hear it anymore. Now, we need to be careful as Christians lest we get dull of hearing. There's a lot of doctrines. There's a lot of, of truths that get taught in this church. And you know what? It may sound repetitive sometimes. But the Bible isn't really that complicated. Look, God's instructions for us, it's not very complicated. It's relatively simple. There's some very basic fundamental truths that we need to learn that we as human beings tend to struggle with with our sinful flesh. But it's the same thing seems to be over and over again. And we need to be constantly reminded of God's word and what he has for how, how we need to live our life, the sins that we need to get out of our life, and, and the things that we need to do to serve and to please God. And it's not complicated. Reading your Bible, praying, Attending church, fellowshipping together, going out, winning souls. These are all real basic things that God has for us to do. It's not, like I said, it's not complicated. Um, you know, not, not consuming alcohol, not, you know, feasting the, the lust of your eyes on, on, on the, the holly weird and, and the, the other things that are being promoted out in the world, not being a friend of the world, but being separate and being, uh, living a righteous life. It, it, it's not difficult. It's a difficult life to lead. It could be hard to, to walk the right path, but the, the concepts are real basic. They're real simple. And what happens oftentimes is that people can get dull of hearing. Oh, man, there's pastors preaching on drinking alcohol again. You don't want to hear that. But oftentimes we don't want to hear it because you don't like what's being said. We got to make sure we don't get ears that are dull of hearing. We just... Turn, turn things off. Oh, yeah, talking about gender roles again. Talking about the, the role of a man versus the role of a woman in today's backward society. 
There's a lot of things. You know, the Bible's not politically correct. In case you haven't read the Bible for yourself before, you read through the pages. It's not politically correct. And you know what? The world hates God's Word. The world rejected Jesus Christ, by and large. If Jesus Christ came and He was crucified, how much more are they going to do to His own household? You that are of His house. And um, it's not a popular message, but especially for us as believers, we need to make sure that our ears are not dull of hearing. That we don't get to the point to where we're just turning off and I don't want to listen to God's word. I've heard this before. Yeah, I've heard this over and over again. You know, wives be obedient to your own husbands. Yeah, I've heard it over and over again. Stop rambling on that. Hey, that's what the Bible says though. And you need to check your own heart and make sure your heart is not wax gross if God's word is becoming a burden for you to hear. The, the Apostle Paul wrote, you know, it is not grievous for me to write the same things unto you, for you but for you it's necessary. And, I, and I'm sorry I, I didn't quote that exactly correctly, but um, he was telling them that, you know, for me to write these same things unto you, it's not grievous to me. Just like it's not grievous when we go out and preach the gospel. Hey, it's the same gospel message. But you know what? It's not, it's not a burden. It's not, it's not boring. It's not like we have, oh man, I got to say the same story again about Christ. No, it's, it's, it, it's, it's exciting every single time. And we ought to make sure that whether it's giving the gospel to someone else or hearing from God's word, because it is relatively basic. I mean, God's law is, is, is contained in, in a short section of this book and, and you know, the rest of it. There's, there's a lot of topics that it goes over, but, but by and large, what God has for us to do is very simple. We need to make sure that just because you may hear things over and over again, that we don't just get dull of hearing. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter number 8. This is going to be the same, um, par the parallel passage from, from Matthew 13 and Luke chapter 8. We're going to see this same, um, the same parable here. The parable of the sower. And what I find to be interesting also is that, you know, Jesus gives all these parables and he's given them basically to the lost. And when you find people who have the most messed up doctrine, the most doctrine that's just completely false, they always turn to parables to support what they believe. Because they don't understand. See, we ought to, and this is kind of a side note, when we f have a basis or foundation for our doctrine, it ought to be the clear teachings of Christ and the things that are just laid out explicitly in the Bible and not going to the, you know, to the parables that are just, can be interpreted maybe a few different ways. Like, for, well, for example, the parable of the sower, that can't, if you just read the parable, you can interpret that maybe many different ways, but Jesus went and explained it. He gives the explanation of it, and that's clear. And he says, you know what? This is what it all means. This is what the, who the sower is. This is what the seed is. It's the Word of God. He tells you all these things, but he doesn't do that for every single parable that is written in the Bible. And you'll notice that when people have these, these doctrines of, oh, well, you could lose your salvation, They'll go to the seven virgins and their lamps and how their lamps are out of oil. These are the places they go. See, the Bible says right here you can lose your salvation. No. Jesus Christ said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's a very clear verse. That's a very clear verse that says, Look, you have everlasting life. It lasts forever. You have eternal life. You shall not come and come. Those are very clear verses. But you know, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for example, with salvation also. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. Our salvation is not based on our works at all. But the people who want to say, well, no, you do have to have works, will tend to, to turn to the parables where they're just interpreting it different ways. So when we get our doctrine, we're, we're going to stand on something and stand on what we believe. Hey, parables are great to support as supporting evidence, so yes, but we ought to have clear statements saying, this is why I believe what I believe. Now look at Matthew, or Luke chapter 8, excuse me, Luke chapter 8, verse number 10. He's going to explain the parable of the sower. We already read it in Matthew 13 when we read through the entire chapter. Look at verse number 10 of Luke 8. And he said unto you, and he said, excuse me, 
Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So Jesus is explaining the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the very first group of people within the parable of the sower, they don't get saved. They, they, they have the, the seed sown in their heart. Somebody's preaching the gospel to them. They're preaching God's word. The word is being planted. It's being sown into their heart. But they don't receive it. They don't believe. They don't, the, 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 the seed just, just falls by the wayside. And then the Bible says the devil just comes along. He snatches it away. He doesn't want them to, to believe that. He doesn't want them to get saved later on. So he snatches it out of their heart. <clears throat> Verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Now, I believe when Jesus, I think this is very clear, that all the rest of these examples are people that, have, that are saved because they all receive the word. The Bible says in John uh, 1, 13, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The moment a person receives the seed, receives the word of God, when they put their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the moment you are born again. That is the moment that you are saved. You are a child of God the moment you receive that seed. The same way that it works physically. When a man's seed is conceived within the womb, there's a new life there. There's a new person there. And it happens in an instant. The moment that that seed is conceived, the moment that the seed is received, the Word of God in a person's heart, that moment the person believes, receives that seed, there's a new creature that's born that very instant. Praise the Lord for that. Now, unfortunately, some people are people that... that are get the word they're sown on the rock they have no root in themselves they hear the word they receive it with joy they're happy they get saved they receive Christ but what happens in time of temptation they fall away they have no character they have no root they have no no grounding verse 14 and that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. And again, here's another example of people that they receive the seed, they start to grow, but then they just get distracted with the cares of this world. And, and look, it could be easy to do. You, just because you're saved doesn't mean you are automatically super Christian and you're going to do everything right all the time. It's easy to get trapped into the, the world, you know, the, the money and, and doing other things and living for your flesh and doing all this other stuff and be distracted. And you know what's going to happen if that happens? You're going to be choked out. You're not going to do anything for God. You're not going to be living a life that he has for you. You're not going to be bringing forth any fruit. And when you bring forth fruit, you're reproducing, right? That's what fruit is. When you have an apple tree, it brings forth fruit. It reproduces all kinds of apples. And when you're a Christian and you bring forth fruit, what are you doing? You're reproducing other Christians. You're bringing forth other people. You're, you're, you're sowing that seed of, of, of God, the Word of God, into people's hearts so that they could get saved. And you're bringing forth other disciples, other Christians, other people. That is our job to bear fruit as a Christian. And then, of course, it talks about, but that on good ground are they, in verse 15, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. And he's saying, this is the whole point of your salvation. Look, when you have this, you have this light inside of you. Don't put a bushel over it. Don't hide it. You need to put it on a candlestick and light the way for everyone else. This is what we are supposed to do. But just as in the, the bearing fruit example, just because, think about this. If, um, if we plant an apple seed, in the ground. That apple seed came from another apple, right? Which came from an apple tree. 
it gets planted in the ground and it starts to grow. And it's not bearing any fruit at all. Does that mean that's not an apple tree? No. It came from an apple seed, right? If it came from an apple seed, it's an apple tree. But it's not producing anything. So it's going to be good for nothing. Now, once it starts to, to produce fruit, hey, praise the Lord, it's, it's good. It's, it's doing its job. It's performing its function as an apple tree. But just because it's not bringing forth the fruit doesn't mean it's not an apple tree. There's another parable in the Bible where it talks about um, a tree, that, the exact same example, that's not bearing forth any fruit. And he says, Lord, what shall we do with this? And he says, you know, dig about it, dung it, and wait another year. We'll see. And then if, there's, if it still doesn't produce any fruit, then we'll just cut it down. And I believe that these examples are for us as believers to take to heart that God has a job for us to do. We need to be bearing fruit in our life. Now, every believer does not always bear forth fruit. They get distracted with the cares of this world. Other things happen. Their ears become dull of hearing. They don't want to hear about it anymore. And they walk in the flesh and they don't walk in the spirit. <clears throat> and some of those examples, we need to take heed that, look, when God is done with you, and if, if you're not going to be producing for Him, what good are you going to be? If you have no fruit to bear, you know, God holds our breath in His hand. He could just, just take us and say, okay, well, you're not doing what I had for you to do. I've got all this work for you to do. I've been trying. I've been, you know, sending preachers. I've been sending people, but your ears, you've, you've closed your ears. You don't want to hear about it anymore. So I'm going to, you know, it's one of the things that God has done in the past that we see in his examples in the Bible is that he could end our life. Now, the, before he, do, he does that, I think he'll try to, to dung our life. And that's not the pleasant part, right? When, when the chastening of the Lord comes, we're not going to say, hey, you're not doing what I told for you to do, son. You're not doing what I told for you to do, daughter. You're not, you're not living the way I have for you to do. The, the chastening, the rebuking, the disciplining, that's not, that's not a pleasant time. Just like the, the dunging the, the tree, it kind of stinks, right? It's not, it's not a fun part to go through, but it's for your benefit. It's, it's, it's for your good. And we need to make sure that when we hear the chastening of the Lord, when we hear the things that maybe sting a little bit, the, the parts that, that hit our life, that, oh, wow, I'm guilty of that that we take it to heart and we have godly sorrow that leads to repentance so that we could change and become more conformed into what God has for us to be and not stop our ears at the preaching of the word. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts. A lot of great stories in the book of Acts, the, the, the apostles, a lot of it is Apostle Paul, and, and, and there's other chapters with the other apostles going out, doing the, the, the work of God, exciting things, performing miracles. And we see over and over again, the apostle Paul, he's got a heart for the Jews to get saved. You know, in Romans 10, he says that, um, I don't want to misquote it. My, my brain is one blank. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And all throughout the scripture, we see the Apostle Paul. He says, you know, he really has this burden for his brethren, for his physical brethren. In the, you know, not in the Lord, but just the seed of Israel, right? He wants them to get saved. And over and over again, he keeps on going to them and, and preaching the word of God. And by and large, they keep rejecting it. In verse number 25, we could kind of see where Paul just gets fed up. Acts 28, 25 says, And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And he says, I'm done. 
I've had enough. And see, we want to make sure that we don't get to the point with God where God just says, okay, I'm done. Because you've hardened your heart, you've, you, you've, your ears are just dull, you don't want to hear it anymore, and, and you've said it you know, over and over again, you're like the stubborn child that just doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to see even God just says, okay, I'm done. Now, obviously, this is, I believe this is something that unsaved people can do, where they could become reprobate from God and rejected of God, and they've just completely hardened their heart, and God just says, okay, I've given you over to a reprobate mind. And he goes into all the details about that in Romans chapter 1. But even as a believer, you know, we don't, obviously, um, God will never leave us or forsake us. You know, we're still his children, but we don't want to be that stubborn, rebellious child that just doesn't want to hear correction from our father. And we just make our ears dull of hearing. Last place, well, yeah, turn if you would to Hebrews 5. It's not the last place. Don't, it's a shorter sermon this morning, but it's not that short. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 5. The whole sermon, I've been, I've been applying this more to believers since that's what I'm speaking to this morning. But honestly, when we look at the context of the chapters that we're looking at, he was most, it's mostly referring to people who are unbelievers. The, the context of them being um, their ears are dull of hearing and their hearts of wax gross. It's people who, who haven't received the word of God. That's who, in the context who he's referring to. But in Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to see a group of people here. that they ought to be farther along in their, spiritual, in their spiritual life than they actually are. We need to make sure that our hearing is well this morning. Look at uh, verse number 11 of Hebrews 5. The Bible says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age." Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So what are you saying here? He says, look, for the time, for how long that you've been saved, you ought to be teachers of God's word. You ought to be able to, to stand up and preach and be able to teach other people. And he says, but you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He says, you become like a, a, this, a, an infant. You're, you're a baby, you're a spiritual baby in Christ. You need milk. Just as much as my, my six-month-old, my seventh-month-old back there needs milk. That's how he is sustained. He, he's not able, I can't give him a steak. I can't give him a steak dinner and just say, here you go, son, eat up. He's not to that point yet. He's a baby. He's an infant. He needs, he needs his mother's milk. Spiritually, when you're born again, you're a child. You're, you're a newborn child in Christ. We need to learn and to grow and to hear and to be fed and to grow. And he's telling these people, it's a rebuke. So he was saying, look, for the time you ought to be teachers. You've been in this house long enough. It's like if my son, after 15 years, is still, I'm putting him in the, in the little high chair and I'll say, okay, Johnny, here's your, you know, here, here's your mashed up food and I'm going to spoon it in your mouth. That would be ridiculous. It's funny, right? It's a funny thing to think of a 15-year-old boy saying, okay, here you go. Put a bib on him, right? Keep him clean. Well, unfortunately, this is how a lot of believers are today. They're spiritual babies. Hey, for the time, you ought to be able to teach. You ought to know so much now that you should be a teacher, you 30-year-old, 40-year-old, you know, you're, you're, still, you're still being spoon-fed. And you know, hey, if you need to be spoon-fed, come on in. We'll feed you here. But don't stay a baby. You know, there's nothing wrong with a baby. My son back there, there's nothing wrong that he's an infant and that he needs to be spoon-fed. But he needs to grow. 
And there's nothing wrong. If you just got saved yesterday, you're a spiritual baby. Hey, praise the Lord for that. Amen. You need to grow, though. You need to, to get the milk of the word. And don't get discouraged either. A lot of people start off, they get discouraged because they'll start, they'll, they'll, man, I, you know, they just got saved, they're excited, they want to start reading God's Bible. Like, man, there's a lot of stuff, I don't even understand a lot of this stuff. And they still don't get it. And I, and I get it. Look, I, I've been there too. And I think everyone who's saved has been there. You, you get to a lot of portions of Scripture, and I'm not saying I understand everything even now. But don't get overwhelmed when you read the Bible and, you know, you, you just need the milk. You need to grow. You need, you need to go through it and go through it again and go through it again and it'll build your, your learning and your growth will come slowly and come in stages and you'll, and you'll get to the point to where you ought to be teachers, but you need to get to that point. See, the problem is when you refuse all food, when you refuse the milk, you refuse everything, you're not going to grow. I mean, you need to have the food. You need to have the meat in order for your body to grow and to get bigger. For my son to keep growing, he needs to keep eating. And the more he eats, the more he's going to grow. And you need to make sure that you are being fed. One of the ways of being fed with the, with the Word of God is coming to church. You're going to hear it preached. You're going to be here expounded and explained. But that shouldn't be your only way. If, if this is your only method of, be, of, your, of being fed, even if you come to all the services three times a week, that's not a lot of food. I mean, would you only like to eat three meals a week? Can you live? Yeah, you could survive, right? If you ate three meals a week, you could survive as, in this life, right? As a human being, you could survive eating three meals. But you're going to be very hungry. You're going to be emaciated. You are not, you're going to look like, man, you, let's get you some milk. <laughs> let's, get you, let's get you something in your body. You, you need to, to, to get healthy. You need to be healthy. And, and spiritually, we need to be healthy. So it's not just coming to church is enough. You need to be getting the word every day. You need to be feeding yourself every day. And getting in this book, getting in this God's Word, and you know, hopefully growing to the point where that you could be a teacher and that you don't have to be ashamed about, hey, I've been saved for 30 years. And I still just, I still just need to learn the basics, the fundamentals, because I haven't read my Bible at all. I haven't gone to church, and I really don't know anything about what the Bible actually says other than that Christ died and paid for my sins and that I'm saved. But notice this in verse 13 there in Hebrews 5. It says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. By reason of use. It's not even just enough. If you want to grow spiritually, it's not just enough to take it in. You need to put it to use. You need to have your senses exercised thereby and put it into practice. So when you read, you know, the various sins and things that you shouldn't be doing and you're doing them and you just keep on doing them, you're not going to grow that way. It's like you're vomiting the word back up. You're not getting any sustenance. It's going in. It's coming right back out. It's doing no good. You need to take it and by reason of use, be exercised thereof. We need to make sure that we're doing the things that we're reading and learning, and then we're going to grow. And, and when God sees you saying, oh, okay, here's someone who is actually receiving what I'm giving them. And let's be honest, when you read your word, there's sometimes, you know, I know sometimes I get these, these enlightening moments where, oh, man, God just really made the light bulb just turn on. Wow, I understand what it's talking about. That's great. You know, praise the Lord for that. And the more you get those moments and you, and you look at this, or when you realize, oh, wow, yeah, I shouldn't be doing this. And when you change, when God sees that you actually have a heart that, that wants to listen, you want to be obedient to God, he'll open up even more of your understanding to you. He'll, he'll, he'll let you understand more of his word because he says, hey, here's someone that wants to do the work. Here's someone who's, who's willing to hear and to do. In James chapter 1, we're admonished, be, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You're only, you're only fooling yourself. If you're just going to be a hearer and not a doer, you're just deceiving your own self. You know, a lot of people like to, to come to church and, and just put on a big show that, oh, yep, yeah, I, I go to church every week. But you hear the word, 
but you don't do anything about it and they're here as only and they're just you know you're not fooling anyone around you it doesn't even matter because who cares what other people think about you you should care about what God thinks about you and when God sees you just come in and say yeah you're hearing it but you're not doing anything you're deceiving your own self. The Bible says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. When we hear the Bible, when we hear God's word, you hear it preached, you say, wow, it's, it's like looking at yourself in a glass. Where you, you start to see yourself for who you really are. Especially when you hear um, the harder preaching on, on the various sins or whatever. And you say, wow, you know, this is really convicting me. I, I really have this problem in my life. I really need to fix this. But if you don't do anything about it, you're going to forget about it. You hear about it. You see, you see yourself in the mirror. You say, wow, it's a problem. You say you have these, you know, some big growth or something growing on your face. And you don't realize it. And you go and you look in the mirror and you say, oh, man, wow, that's nasty. I need, I need to take care. I need to do something about that. But then you walk away and you don't do anything about it. You're saying you're just going to forget that it's even there. Forget all about it. We need to make sure that when we hear the word, that our ears are not closed, that we don't stop our ears from hearing. I'll close with this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, there's this whole list of things. You know, the Bible says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. And uh, there's real short uh, phrases in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And there's two that I want to point out in closing. First Thessalonians 5, verse 19 and 20. The Bible says, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. Quenching the spirit means you're, you're, you're filling it. So you think about quenching your thirst. When you quench your thirst, you're making it so you're not thirsty anymore. Right? You're real thirsty. You're, Man, I got this great thirst. And then you get a nice big glass of water. <sighs> My thirst is quenched. It's gone. I don't have that anymore. He's saying, yeah, that's great when you're drinking water and you're thirsty, but don't quench the Spirit. See, the Spirit's going to be driving you to make changes. Your Spirit's going to want to be teaching you. The Spirit's going to want you to walk in the Spirit and do what's right. Don't quench the Spirit and placate the Spirit and just, just put the Spirit away of like, ah, I don't want to do that and, and not listen to the Spirit. We don't want that to be quenched. Our Spirit ought to be lively and continually um, driving us to do more. And we don't want to just despise that. And that's why he says, despise not prophesying. Despise that. Don't, you shouldn't hate the preaching of God's Word. You know, when, when, when whoever gets up here and is, and is preaching God's Word to you and you're reading it and you're hearing it, don't despise that. Now look, and this, this is a pretty benign sermon, but some of them could be pretty rough. Especially because we get inundated with so many lies and so much of this world's influence in our life through the media, through the world, just, just everything that we do. We're bombarded with this. I mean, we're at the point now to where people are, cons are, are thinking that it's acceptable for men to use a woman's restroom. This is how twisted and perverted and backwards our society it is. Is And if you are just... Hear God's word and just go and, and don't do anything about it. And, and you're despising, prophesying, and you're, and you're making your ears dull of hearing. You're going to be way more influenced by this world and start thinking that that perversion is actually okay and acceptable. And it's not. It's disgusting. We need to make sure that we are walking in the Spirit, that we're not quenching the Spirit, that, because the devil's out there to, to make sure that your mind gets twisted around. And if you aren't in His Word daily, it's going to start impacting you. Everybody, if you, if you are not keeping yourself grounded and rooted deep into God's Word and having that, that relationship with God, you're just going to start going the way of the world. There's always influences coming in to make you fall back, to make you backslide. It's going to happen. And, and there is no remaining stagnant in life. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. You're either moving forward in your Christian life and doing better and, and increasing and doing more and more, or you're going back. 
Keep that in mind. Anytime you think that you're just keeping level, you're probably moving backwards. We need to continually make sure that we are pressing forward. And one of the ways we do that is just make sure that our ears are not dull of hearing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your precious gift of eternal life through your Son, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to use that gift. Help us to do the work, dear God. Help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only so we wouldn't just be deceiving ourselves, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us all to grow spiritually. And Lord, I know that and it's okay that we're all at different levels in this room even spiritually, dear Lord. Some, maybe some, some people here are babes in Christ and, and others are full grown, dear Lord. But whatever stage we're in, God, I pray that you would please help us to continue to grow, continue to help us to do more for you and that we would have ears to hear and we wouldn't stop our ears or despise prophesying, dear Lord, but that we would rather receive them with a humble heart, dear Lord, and to do the things that you have laid out for us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.